Well, thanks very much for the invitation, and it's always a pleasure to come back to the Institute. Um, so, uh, I'm going to, uh, to give some sort of uh, introduction to what is not contact homology, uh, which will be fairly sketchy, but uh, just, just to get a background. And then uh, I want to talk about two uh, recent d developments that have happened. Uh, and one of them is uh, this result that the co-normal uh, is a complete invariant, complete not invariant. Uh, so this is joint with uh, uh, Vivek Shende, uh, the alphabetical order, Tobias Ekholm and Vivek Shende. And then the other thing I want to talk about, uh, which I hopefully will have time to get to, is something about the recurrence relation for colored Humphrey polynomials uh, and D modules via uh, symplectic field theory. So this is joint work in progress uh, with uh, Tobias. Okay. Um, so, great. So let's start. So here's here's the setup. So this. Uh, f by the way, for those of you who have heard me talk about this sort of stuff before, I apologize. There will be, there's always some sort of amount of repeat at the beginning, uh, but it'll go pretty fast, I think. So the, the setup is that we have a knot sitting inside of R3 or S3. Um, and uh, so from this, you can construct the Lagrangian co-normal. So the co-normal, uh, which I'll write as LK, this sits inside of uh, the cotangent bundle of R3. So the cotangent bundle of R3 is uh, usual sort of nice symplectic manifold. And the co-normal is, uh, well, it's a set of, so it's a set of points inside of the cotangent bundle that lie above this knot. And uh, the cotangent direction is supposed to annihilate every other tangent directions to the knot at this point. So, uh, so such that Q is in K. And P annihilates this for all of E in T, Q, K. OK, so this is the co-normal. And this is, uh, as well known, this is a Lagrangian. So this, this manifold, this is symplectic. And the co-normal is Lagrangian. Uh, OK. So you can. Uh, encapsulate much the same data by going one dimension down and working in the contact manifold, which is the co-sphere bundle instead. So uh, the unit co-normal uh, sitting inside of, uh, so the unit cotangent bundle, uh, so this is a uh, unit cotangent bundle, which is a contact manifold. Uh, so the contact one form is just the standard Liouville uh, form on uh, this on the cotangent bundle, which uh, you restrict to this, uh, and the unit co-normal is uh, just defined to be the intersection of the co-normal with this, uh, and this is a Legendrian uh, submanifold setting inside of this contact manifold which is to say that if you pull back the uh, contact one form on here uh, to this uh, submanifold, you get 0. And uh, there's also some dimension condition that it's maximal dimensional for this to happen. Um, so here's a picture. Uh, this is going to look like a slightly weird picture, because I, I want to sort of be inspired by the picture of a Weinstein manifold. So let's say that this is. Uh, T star R3, but I'm only going to take the disk part of T star R3. Uh, so the disk cotangent bundle, its boundary is going to be the unit cotangent bundle. Um, okay. Uh, and inside of this disk cotangent bundle, there's the zero section. Um, and now, let's see. Uh, it's not that different. 
So here is the not k sitting inside of the zero section. And uh, lying above k is this uh, Lagrangian LK. And where it intersects the boundary, this is lambda k. OK, so that's the picture. Um, and uh, uh, you can just check. So the co-normal bundle topologically is a solid torus. It's topologically the same as the normal bundle, which is the same as a uh, tubular neighborhood of the knot. Uh, so the unit co-normal is like the boundary of the uh, tubular neighborhood of K. So that's a, a two-dimensional torus. So topologically, uh, lambda K is a two-torus. And this sits inside of uh, the uh, this thing, which if you forget about its uh, context structure, uh, you can just think of this as maybe R3 cross S2. Um, great. So starting with the knot, we now have a uh, Legendrian two torus sitting inside of this five-dimensional contact manifold, uh, and uh, because of the dimension count, you, it's pretty easy to show that. Uh, so for if you start off with a different knot instead of k, uh, then its Legendrian torus will actually well as a smooth torus, it'll it'll be isotopic. So uh, if k and k prime are any knots in R3, uh, then lambda k and lambda k prime are smoothly isotopic uh, inside of, so in here. Again, it's just because you have enough dimensions to work with. These are two-dimensional submanifolds inside of this five-dimensional manifold. You just check that they're homotopic, and that means that they have to be isotopic. OK. Um, but we know more than this if, uh, so this, this is for arbitrary knots inside, inside of R3. But if they are actually the same knot in the sense that they're isotopic as smooth knots, uh, so if k is, well, I'll write it like this. So it's, it just means that they're smoothly isotopic knots. Then the isotopy between them gives an isotopy between their Legendrian tori. And that's an isotopy of Legendrian submanifolds. So then. Uh, lambda k is uh, what's called Legendrian isotopic, uh, which is to say isotopic through Legendrian submanifolds inside of this uh, contact manifold. So the idea is then, if we want to study the smooth topology of the knot k, what we can do is we can uh, study the Legendrian, uh, the topology of this Legendrian submanifold lambda k. And in particular, there's, there's sort of a nice way to to do this, which so the idea is to use uh, Legendrian contact homology, which is some well-established uh, package of invariants associated to a Legendrian submanifold inside of a contact manifold. Um, so this sort of holomorphic curve type invariants uh, of lambda k to study uh, the the smooth so to study the knot. Uh, so now what I should do is I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Legendrian contact homology in more generality, and then we'll uh, say something about what, what we get in this particular case. Um, so. so the setup for Legendrian contact homology is that we have a uh, Legendrian submanifold inside of a contact manifold. Again, I'm, I'm actually not, uh, I'm going to uh, state some stuff, and I'm not going to give that much in the way of definitions, but it's OK, because it'll, uh, I'm, somehow, this, this is supposed to give you an impressionistic view of this, this field. So uh, out of this data, a Legendrian submanifold inside of a contact manifold, we get uh, what's called the Legendrian uh, differential graded algebra associated to this. So I want to say a little bit. Uh, about what, what this is without actually really defining it. Um, so uh, what A is, is uh, it's some sort of tensor algebra. So this is the, <laughs> the, uh, so there are two tricky parts to defining this uh, differential graded algebra. One of them is to define the algebra. 
The other one is to define the differential. The, the algebra is a little bit easier, but it's, it's still, for those of you uh, sort of familiar with various Fleur theories, this is a type of Fleur theory, but it's, it's a little bit more complicated than some of them. So this is going to be a tensor algebra over some weird ring, which will be, uh, so I'll talk about this. This is going to be important at some point. But this is the group ring of the group that is relative H2 of the contact manifold rel of the Legendrian. Um, and it's generated by uh, what are called rabe chords of lambda. Uh, so rabe chords are just uh, flows of the rabe vector field on the contact manifold that begin and end on the Legendrian. And I'm just going to assume uh, that uh, there are finitely many of them, which is uh, generically the case if lambda is compact. Uh, so uh, and uh, I guess I need a couple more assumptions, but okay, so I'm just going to assume there are finitely many of them, and I will just represent them by the letters a1 through a n. So those are the rabe chords. There are n of them, those are the rabe chords of lambda. Um, and the differential, so that's the, the algebra. And the algebra doesn't do very much. So it's, it's only sort of interesting in the context of the differential. So the differential counts um, holomorphic disks uh, rigid, uh, rigid holomorphic disks in the symplectization of this uh, contact manifold, which is R cross V. Uh, and the boundary of the holomorphic disks are supposed to be on the Lagrangian cylinder uh, that's given by R cross lambda. So let me draw a picture. That's, okay. uh, so here's a disk, and here is the symplectization. Uh, Usually draw it. It's somehow it's, a, it's getting bigger as you go in the r direction. So this is the r direction here, and v is going along in this direction. Um, and let's see. Let's try this. Oh. Mm -hmm. Orange looks good. Uh, okay. So uh, inside of here, we have the cylinder r cross lambda. So lambda sits inside of v. Uh, we have this cylinder r cross lambda. And this is Lagrangian. So th there's some natural symplectic structure on r cross v, uh, given a contact form on v. And uh, with respect to that, then this, this cylinder is Lagrangian. And that's, that Lagrangian cylinder is going to be the boundary condition for uh, a map from, from a disk into here. Um, and now I think the easiest thing, the best way that I know to draw this is, so firstly, the disk is going to have some number of punctures on its boundary. So it's a closed disk, but minus a number of boundary punctures. And uh, what, the, what this maps to inside of here is it looks like something like this. So inside of there. So what have I just done right here? So this, so each of the boundary punctures, so one of them is mapping off to plus infinity in the r direction, and the other ones are mapping off to minus infinity. Uh, the parts that are away from the punctures, so that is to say everything on the boundary of the disk, is mapping to this Lagrangian cylinder r cross lambda. Um, and uh, th what the puncture is mapped to is they, they as they're asymptotic. So neighborhoods of the punctures are asymptotic to uh, a, well one at, at plus infinity in the r direction and some number at minus infinity. They're asymptotic to rabe chords. So this is AI, AJ1, AJ2, AJK. OK. So if you just look up here, this is, this is a, a chord that begins and ends on uh, lambda. So this is exactly what I was uh, calling a rape chord. OK. Um, great. Uh, let's see. OK. I'll come back over here. Uh, 
Um, so the differential counts things like this. And uh, what's, what this particular uh, disk that I've drawn contributes to is the differential of AI. So AI is an element inside of this algebra. Uh, and uh, the differential of AI is going to be uh, sum of terms that look like. So this particular term will give you, so you take the words AJ1 through AJK. So that is to say, you read the rape chords along the bottom of this holomorphic disk. Uh, sign out front that involves orienting moduli spaces that I don't want to talk about. Um, and then I want to also keep track of the uh, homology class of, of this holomorphic disk. So uh, this sits inside of here, it's, it's sits inside of uh, R cross V with boundary and R cross lambda. So its homology class gives you a, rel a class in relative H2 of V rel lambda. That's a slight lie because there's, there's this bits on the top and bottom, but you can close those up. So. I'm going to write this as, so I'm going to multiply this in front by this homology class. But maybe I'll write it in exponential notation just because homology we think of as being in an additive group. And I want this to be multiplicative. So OK. So uh, the class of delta is in H2 of V rel lambda. OK. And this is why that, that weird uh, coefficient ring shows up, because uh, we're, we're multiplying this, this formal product of rave chords by the homology class of the, of the holomorphic disk. Okay. Uh, and then there, so that was this particular term. There may be other terms if there are other holomorphic disks. Uh, but uh, the, the holomorphic disks with an end at uh, AI at the top all contribute to the differential of AI. Okay. Um, so in this case, so the, the case that we're actually interested in is the case where V is equal to uh, the unit cotangent bundle of R3 and lambda is lambda K. Uh, so this is a two torus that's null homologous inside of uh, this five dimensional manifold. And so some easy uh, algebraic topology calculation tells you that, that in this case, H2 of V lambda is it's split, so it gives you uh, it's H2 of V plus uh, H1 of lambda. OK, V is S2 cross R3. So H2 of V is just Z plus. Uh, and then lambda is a 2 torus, so H1 of lambda is Z squared. Um, and I'll give the generators of these things names. So this will be generated by something I'll call Q. And this one, this will be generated by uh, lambda and mu, and the letters are supposed to indicate, so the, uh, the Legendrian torus, remember, you can think of that as the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of the knot. So it has a longitude class and a meridian class, and that's, that's this lambda and mu. Okay. Um, so this, this means that in this case, the DGA, so the Legendrian uh, DGA uh, is some sort of differential graded algebra over uh, the group ring of H2 of V lambda, which in this case is then Z. It's Laurent polynomials in three variables, Q plus or minus 1, lambda plus or minus 1, mu plus or minus 1. OK. So we now have some sort of uh, algebra over, so it's generated by rabe chords of lambda k, whatever those are. And it's, it's over this particular uh, coefficient ring. OK. So if you work with links, oh. uh, Yeah, if, if you work with links, then the q stays, but you now have a lambda, one lambda and mu for each component of the link. So this, it just becomes a bigger thing, just because h1 of it is bigger. So there's no like, uh, technical difficulty? There's no technical, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, it, links actually work just as well as, as knots, and in fact, are somewhat more interesting. But uh, I probably won't talk about them in this, but yes. Other questions? OK. Um, great. Uh, so that's, that's the introduction. Oh, sorry. Uh, right, so uh, there's a result that says that, uh, so uh, d squared is equal to 0. Uh, so you extend the differential from just generators to the entire algebra by the Leibniz rule. And then 
the usual sort of flow result is that d squared is equal to 0. And furthermore, that uh, uh, h star of this algebra with this, this differential is an invariant. So this is called LCH star of lambda is invariant under Legendrian isotopy of lambda. Uh, and it's called Legendrian contact homology, LCH. Um, and in the case, so in the case that we're interested in, where uh, lambda is lambda k sitting inside of st star r3, uh, this is called not contact homology. So, L, so LCH star of lambda k is not contact homology, is the not contact homology for k. And if we change k by smooth isotopy, that changes the Legendrian lambda k by Legendrian isotopy. So by this invariance result, uh, which I guess in this circumstance is due to Ekholm, et Nyer, and Sullivan, um, that tells you that this is actually a, a smooth not invariant. So it's an invariant, a smooth not invariant. OK, it's just a not invariant of k. Okay. Uh, right. Um, so that was the setup. Uh, the next thing uh, that I want to talk, to talk about is this uh, question of uh, the co complete invariant. So there's there's an open question, which is is not contact homology a complete invariant? Okay. So that means if uh, uh, if LCH star of lambda k is isomorphic to LCH star. So the, by, by the way, this is uh, as as some sort of algebra over uh, the coefficient ring. If you have two knots k and k prime and they have isomorphic invariants. Does that mean uh, is k actually smoothly isotopic to k prime? Uh, and we don't know. So this we know that this is a pretty strong invariant of knots. Uh, so I don't know any counterexamples uh, to to the conjecture that this would be a complete invariant. But on the other hand, uh, we just don't know at this point. Um, but what we do actually know is that you can enhance this uh, invariant a little bit, and uh, what you end up with is actually. Uh, a complete invariant. So here's a theorem of Ekholm, myself, and Vivek Shende. Um, and this was pr first proven using, uh, by uh, Vivek Shende using sheaves. Using sheaves and microlocal sheaves. Uh, and this is that. Uh, the Legendrian torus itself, lambda k, is a complete invariant. Oops. Uh, so what that means is that if uh, lambda k and lambda k prime are Legendrian isotopic, uh, then k and k prime are actually the same are smoothly isotopic knots. Okay, and in fact, I'm going to say uh, a little something a little bit more precise than that using uh, not contact homology, but but this is this is the result. Um, so somehow th this is related to some some old ideas of Arnold uh, that if you start with something in the smooth category and push it into the symplectic category by taking cotangent bundles then that should hopefully not forget very much information. And this tells you that in this particular setting, it actually doesn't forget any information at all. So you start with a smooth knot k, and you push it into the symplectic world by looking at this Legendrian torus. Uh, and that the isotopy class of that, does, it remembers, completely encodes the knot. Um, okay. Oh, actually, it's sort of like keeping this picture here. Okay, so uh, 
What I want to do very briefly is talk a little bit about how we prove this result. Uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on it because I want to get to some other stuff uh, that has happened recently. Uh, but the idea is, uh, behind doing this, is some sort of relatively stupid idea, which is to uh, just add a point somewhere in R3 that's not on the knot. So just uh, add a point P in R3 minus the knot to the picture. So here's the point P. Uh, now we can look at, so the cotangent bundle of R3, we can look at the fiber over P. And if we just look at the disk part of the cotangent bundle, then that's just a three-dimensional disk. Uh, and it's Lagrangian. So um, what we can do <coughs> is, I don't know how to draw this precisely. It intersects just in one point here. Um, so, so this is going to be LP. So uh, let's LP be the cotangent fiber of P. And let's let lambda P be the cotangent fiber at infinity. So this is LP intersected with ST star R3. So this is um, lambda P up here. And what we've just gotten is this is, so remember this is, LP is a cotangent fiber, so that's topologically a disk. Uh, its boundary is a two-sphere. Um, so, so this is a Legendrian, so it's easy to check that it's Legendrian. This is a Legendrian uh, S2, and it's disjoint from the Legendrian torus uh, lambda k. It's a, I'll just say this is a, so you, you now have a Legendrian torus and a Legendrian sphere, and they're disjoint from each other. The reason they're disjoint from each other is just that we, they live over different points. OK. Uh, and there's an observation. Uh, which is that if, uh, so if lambda k is isotopic, Legendrian isotopic to lambda k prime, so there's an isotopy that sends one of them to the other, and p is a point disjoint from oops, both uh, k and k prime, then it's also the case that if you take the, the uh, multiple components thing, uh, where I just take the union with lambda p, then this has to be isotopic to lambda k prime union lambda p. So if I have another knot k prime in here, and lambda k and lambda k prime are isotopic, then th that's still true even if I th throw in this disjoint component that's just uh, lambda p. And the reason for this is because R3 is non-compact. So whatever the isotopy is that takes this to that, it lies over some compact region in R3. I can just move P way far away from that, and then it won't intersect the isotopy at all. So it's one of those things that Vivek pointed it out to us, and we thought, oh, that's. <laughs> so firstly, it's sort of obvious in, in retrospect. And secondly, it's not clear that this would buy you anything because it's sort of a silly observation. But in fact, it, it does buy you something. So, um, so now if I start with a not K, I can then uh, get its Legendrian torus out of this, and I can take the union of that with this cotangent fiber lambda p. And now I can look at, so this is now a Legendrian uh, link. It's a, it's a disjoint union of two Legendrians. And just like for a Legendrian knot, I can then look at its Legendrian contact homology. Um. <coughs> So it's, a, it's the same deal as what I drew over here, except now the lambda has multiple components. Um, this is maybe, there's, there's some quotient of this that gives the original knot contact homology, but maybe I'll call this enhanced knot contact homology. Um, and the theorem 
the, the more precise version of this theorem here, well, actually, the, no, the, a precursor to that theorem um, is that from this enhanced thing, I should say uh, plus, plus a product structure. There's some sort of product structure on this uh, differential graded algebra that's, uh, that comes from counting. So, so far we've counted only, this is for the experts, I guess. So, so far we've only counted disks with one positive end, but the product structure counts disks with two positive ends from holomorphic disks with two positive ends. Um, we can recover uh, the group ring of pi 1 of R3 minus K. So the group ring of the complements, of the fundamental group of the not complements. Um, uh, so I don't really want to get into how, how we prove this because that would take the rest of the time. Uh, but uh, Somehow, uh, the, the way I, I think about this in my head is that adding in this, this uh, lambda p is, as, is like adding in a base point in the, into the picture. And then uh, pi 1 of r3 minus k is, is based at p. So, so somehow there's an isomorphism that sends us to the group ring of uh, loops that are based at the point p. Ah, so they both, so the two positive ends, they're both at rabe chords, and they're, one is a rabe chord from lambda k to lambda p, and the other one is the other way around. Yeah. Um, so in fact, uh, keeping track of these holomorphic disks with two positive ends is in general a little bit of a tricky thing. So this is some sort of Legendrian symplectic field theory. Uh, but in this case, where you have a two component link, um, there's some work of Ekholm that, that says that it's, everything is okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. And then there's some old work uh, that that says that. So once you recover the group ring of pi one, uh, then you can recover pi one itself as a group. Um, so it's not always the case that the group ring of a group uh, remembers the group itself, uh, but it is true in certain cases, and this is one of them. The, the, the case that I have in mind is when the group is uh, what's called left orderable. So there's a, a total ordering that's left invariant. Um, so the uh, corollary of this is that from, whoops, from the Legendrian isotopy type of lambda k, we can recover the smooth isotopy type of k, which is to say this, this result that I have up here. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll say something about the proof of this. Um, given this thing, which I'm black boxing. Uh, so the proof is that. Uh, from, from the group ring of pi 1 of r3 minus k, as I said, you can get the group itself, pi 1 of r3 minus k. Uh, and this uses the fact that not groups, these groups of the fundamental, uh, sorry, fundamental groups of not complements, what we usually call not groups, are left orderable. That's a nice little algebraic exercise that once you have a left orderable group, uh, essentially you just look at the, um, the subring of units, sorry, the sub multiplicative subgroup of units inside of here, and that's uh, more or less this. Um, and then there's a bit more work. So uh, with uh, the homology coefficients, these these lambdas and mu's that I, I mentioned before uh, allows us to uh, extract. Also, the, the classes of the longitude and meridian, uh, longitude and meridian classes inside of pi 1 of r3 minus k. 
So again, uh, given a knot, there's a, it has a longitude and a meridian, and those both give you elements inside of pi 1 of R3 minus k. Uh, and those essentially correspond to this lambda and mu that I mentioned before uh, in, in knot contact homology. Um, Uh, the meridian is well defined. The longitude oh, is, I mean, yeah, yeah. So the longitude, I'm assuming something about framing. So so the, you have to choose a framing of the knot to get the to get a well defined longitude. Uh, but for knots inside of R three, we can just choose say the ciphered framing. So there's there is a canonical way to choose this in this case. Um, and then from this, there's some work of Waldhausen, 1968, uh, which says that pi 1 of R3 minus k, along with uh, what's called the peripheral subgroup, which is the subgroup generated by the longitude and meridian, uh, completely determines k. Oops. If you don't have the longitude and meridian, then uh, you can't, for instance, tell a knot apart from its mirror. Uh, there's some, some subtler things as well. But once you have a longitude and meridian, uh, class inside of there, then the isomorphism class of this group along with these two distinguished elements completely determines the knot. Um, okay. Great. So that's, that's my really quick uh, exposition of this result that the Legendrian co-normal uh, determines the knot. Questions? OK, great. Um, excellent. So uh, now what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about a new development that's in progress. Um, it changes, but up to, it changes by quasi isomorphism or something. So yeah, you you move p around, uh, then lambda p just moves around, and because the entire the homology is invariant under Legendrian isotopy of the entire thing, uh, then it it'll just change by something that's a quasi isomorphism. So then it's not, so it's not obvious how to get rid of the p. Ah, it is not obvious how to get rid of the p. That's right. Um, You do have a monodromy, yeah. And in fact, uh, I think s that's that's a nice way to to picture this because then you get an action of of the knot group on on this. And I think uh, all the pictures that you think ought to correspond to each other, in fact, do. Um, but I, I haven't we haven't worked that out. But I, it, it has to be true. Um, okay. Um, okay. So. What I want to spend the rest of the time talking about is uh, Homfley, so the colored Homfley recursion via SFT, uh, symplectic field theory. Um, and so I'm going to do a little bit more discussion of uh, not contact homology, and the, but then there will be a, a bit of just sort of straight uh, not theory. Um, so remember that, uh, so. Uh, if you have a knot k, so what I said in the in the introduction was that you get some sort of differential graded algebra, a d over uh, z brackets q plus or minus one lambda plus or minus one mu plus or minus one. Okay. Uh, oh, I haven't talked about the grading at all, but uh, this is graded in non-negative degrees, and this coefficient ring is completely in degree zero. Um, OK, so uh, there's a notion that's really useful in contact homology called an augmentation. So an augmentation of uh, this differential graded algebra is a differential graded algebra map. Uh, we usually write it as epsilon from AD to uh, pick your favorite fields. Uh, I'm going to pick the complexes, but you can do this in, the, for, in other circumstances as well. So just the complex numbers 
This is a differential graded algebra where it's in grading zero and the differential is just zero. Um, so this is just a fancy way of saying it's an algebra map um, epsilon from A to C such that epsilon composed with the differential in A is zero. Um, so this is a, a way of keeping track of a little bit of the, the multiplicative structure on this uh, differential graded algebra. Um, I'll write out a space over there. So I'll go back to the left. Um, so given an augmentation uh, epsilon, uh, so it in particular maps this coefficient ring to C as well, which is to say it maps Q, lambda, and mu to uh, non-zero complex numbers. So epsilon of Q, epsilon of lambda, epsilon of mu sits inside of C minus the origin cubed. Sorry, my epsilons look the same, but OK. Um, so then the so there's this then a notion called the augmentation variety okay and it is uh, the set of these things uh, over all Uh, augmentations for this particular knot. Um, and this is now a subset of C star cubed. Uh, one way you can think of it is uh, the differential gives uh, a number of expressions that uh, are, ex are polynomials in the rabe chords with coefficients in Q, lambda, and mu. And these are the set of values of Q, lambda, and mu so that all of those polynomials have a common zero. Um, and then you take you do some some sort of fancy footwork to this. So it's it's the you take the closure of the highest dimensional part of this. Uh, I'll just write it as the closure of this uh, is. Uh, so it turns out that if you take the highest dimensional part of this, so this is uh, a variety sitting inside of a three-dimensional compact uh, sorry complex space. And uh, the highest dimensional part is two-dimensional, or at least conjecturally, it's always two-dimensional. Uh, so um, it's the zero locus of a single polynomial. So the vanishing locus of a single polynomial um, which we write as aug sub k of uh, q, lambda, and mu. I'm going to reorder my things at this point. Uh, and this is called the, so this, this is in, this is a polynomial. And it turns out it has integer coefficients, so that it doesn't really matter. Uh, and here, and this is called the augmentation polynomial. OK, so this is some sort of knot invariant that's associated to a knot, which is a three-variable polynomial that is obtained by this sort of uh, knot contact homology holomorphic curve stuff. Uh, you cannot necessarily recover the augmentation from those three numbers. So in particular, there might not be a unique augmentation that gives you those three numbers. Uh, calculating these things is, at least in theory, algorithmically possible. It's some sort of problem in elimination theory. Um, we've managed to do it for a lot of small knots, so it's, it's actually doable, calculable uh, to some degree in practice. Um, so, okay, so this is sort of an interesting thing to, to study by itself. I think the thing that makes it especially interesting is that there's uh, there's some uh, contact with the uh, 
physics and topological string theory. Um, so I'll distill it down to the following conjecture that comes from physics. Uh, so one is that there is a quantization. I'll say, I'll, uh, say uh, more precisely what I mean by this um, of the uh, augmentation variety. Okay. Uh, and the second thing is that this quantization determines the recurrence relation uh, for the colored Humphrey polynomials. Uh, I'll also, so I'm, I'm going to write this down. This, is, this looks pretty vague, uh, but I'll try to say a little bit more precisely what I mean by these things. Um, by the way, at this point, it should not be at all clear why this has anything to do with physics. Uh, this is, but this is something that the physicists told us, that these, ought, these things ought to be true. And what is the symplectic form for quanta? Oh, it's uh, the uh, so um, you treat Q as a parameter. So this is so then uh, uh, if you take a Q slice of this, then, then there are two two uh, variables lambda and mu, and it's d log lambda wedge d log mu. Um. So let me say more precisely what, what this conjecture is supposed to say. Uh, do I need this anymore? OK, so I'm, I'm going to write, uh, so we have these two parameters, lambda and mu. I'm going to write them uh, as exponentials. So uh, just formally, I'll write lambda as e to the x and mu is equal to e to the p. Uh, x and p are supposed to be positioned in the momentum. Uh, and let's suppose that we formally set things up so that these two things didn't actually quite commute. So in this, in, in, uh, this ring right here, uh, clearly lambda and mu commute. But we could set, try to set things up so that they didn't commute uh, and suppose uh, they don't commute, so the, the quantized version of this is supposed to be you set p is equal to maybe h bar d by dx, and this tells you that um, the commutator of p and x is h bar, if I did this correctly. Um, and when you exponentiate, this tells you that the product of mu times lambda is equal to something times lambda times mu, it's e to the h bar, which I'll call little q, so where q is equal to e to the h bar. OK, so I've started with, with a world where lambda and mu commute. Now I've, I've uh, tried to set things up so that they don't quite commute. They commute up to this factor of, of q. Uh, and so the classical limit of this, where they do commute, is when I, I, uh, t uh, sorry, h bar goes to 0, and then q is 1 and everything is okay. Okay, so the so the let me say what this conjecture from physics is more precisely. Uh, so the first claim is that ugh, the augmentation variety of K uh, lifts to a D module. Um, um, uh, and the D module in particular, it's going to be, so I first take the Weyl algebra generated by, so W is the Weyl algebra generated by, uh, so I am, a, I am a simpleton with regard to these matters, so I, I'm just going to say it in the way I, I understand. So it's generated by uh, four parameters, lambda, mu, Q and little q, and all of these commute except that mu times lambda is equal to q times lambda and mu. So they all commute except uh, mu times lambda is equal to q times lambda mu. Um, 
So the so just take Laurent polynomials in these things, except they're not quite polynomials because these two variables don't commute. Um, and now I'm going to mod out by a principal ideal inside of here, and the principal ideal will be generated by a polynomial. Okay, I insist on calling it a polynomial, but it's actually an element inside of this biologebra. Uh, lambda mu q q. Um, So this is this this thing right here. This is inside of W. So this is just the, the quotient of, of this vial algebra by, by some principal ideal. Uh, the ideal is generated by this thing, and then what it means that this is a lift of the original augmentation variety is that if I uh, so where if I take this thing. So this is again this is a four variable polynomial, uh, except that lambda and mu don't quite commute. Uh, if I set q equals one inside of here, then I get a three variable polynomial where lambda and mu do honestly commute, and that is supposed to be the uh, augmentation polynomial. Okay, so there's some way to quantize this variety uh, so that uh, in this classical limit we get the original thing. Um, Okay, that's part one. Um, part two uh, has to do with these colored Humphrey polynomials. So. Um, Uh, sorry, this is not part of the claim. This is actually true. Uh, the colored Humphrey polynomials uh, symmetrically colored Humphrey polynomials. So I'll write this as. Uh, so if you haven't seen these before, um, to a partition, uh, this associates uh, some sort of two-variable polynomial to a partition and, and a not k. This associates some sort of two-variable polynomial. Uh, and the partitions I'm going to take are just single row partitions. It's uh, supposed to correspond to representations of un or something. Uh, so for a fixed not k, I get a sequence of polynomials where I just increase the number of boxes from 1 to infinity. Uh, so this is a sequence of polynomials and two variables. And it is known that uh, this sequence of polynomials uh, is what's called Q holonomic. Uh, and so this is a result of Stavros Garofalidis, Aaron Lauda, and Tang Lei. Um, and what does this mean? So what this means essentially is that it means that they satisfy a recurrence relation. Um, so let's define. So I'm going to I'm going to write the op, uh, the recurrence relation in a slightly weird way. So I'm going to define operators which I will suggestively call lambda and mu on this set of polynomials. So I'll write it for short P K N of A Q uh, as follows. So lambda. The operation lambda just moves, it changes n to n plus 1. So lambda applied to pn is pn plus 1. And uh, mu times pn gives q to the n times pn. Um, and I will just note at this point that if I did this correctly, then these two operators, lambda and mu, do not quite commute, but they commute up to a factor of q. Uh, and it should be the same as up there. So uh, mu times lambda is q times lambda mu. Um, so I haven't yet told you what q holonomic meant. The, this, so the, there are operators like this. And the statement that these polynomials are q holonomic is that for fixed, so for fixed not k, there, there is, sorry. In fact, there's a unique minimal relation uh, on these polynomials that you can write as follows. 
uh, a k hat of lambda mu a q p n is equal to zero. So a and q are just parameters. Uh, mu multiplies p n by q to the n, and lambda just shifts over by one. So each monomial will, will involve one of these polynomials, and the sum of these monomials will be some linear combination of these polynomials. Uh, and this is supposed to be true for all n. So this gives some sort of, this is just a fancy way of saying there's a, a linear recurrence relation uh, relating these things okay. uh, for all n. Um, here's the conjecture. So, so, so far, this is not the claim. This is, this is all just true. Uh, the conjecture is that these two things are equal. So, and they, I somehow screwed up notation so that the letters are a little bit different. So I'm going to set Q is equal to A. Uh, I'm sorry. Say, oh, how do I know that? How do I know that this exists? Uh, that is part of the conjecture. We, we have an idea for how to get it, uh, which I will try to explain in the next three minutes. <laughs> but yes. Um. Okay. Uh, actually, I would sort of like to have more space. So if you don't mind, I'm going to erase this bit about the D module. Uh, and just say the following thing. So here's, so here's the picture. So where does the physics come in? So this is a picture in topological string theory. So I guess. Uh, there's some foundational work of Witten. It's a work of many people. Uh, so I'm I'll pick out, in particular, Uguri and Bafa and Aganagic and Bafa. Um, and the, the picture is that colored Humphrey polynomials uh, for K um, So there is some correspondence between uh, these things, which is some sort of churn Simons invariance of K, and open topological strings uh, uh, in the cotangent bundle. So they use S3. I've been using S3 and R3 interchangeably, so don't be too alarmed by the S3 here. So um, the cotangent bundle of S3 with this Lagrangian Co-normal LK sitting inside of it, and the open topological string have have uh, endpoints uh, on the brain that's given by this Lagrangian along with the zero section. Um, so here is. Uh, mm. So here's T star S3, here's S3, here's K, and here's LK. This is the picture that I more prefer drawing for this. Um, so there's, there's a thing called the conifold transition, which collapses the, uh, the zero section S3 to a point and then re replaces it by a, a two sphere. Um, so large n duality says that there's supposed to be some relation between this picture and uh, open topological string in. So, this, so you collapse S3 to a, to a point, uh, and then it resolves to give, uh, so I'll call, call this manifold X. This is uh, resolved conifold. It's the total space of O minus 1 plus O minus 1 over P1, but since I'm running out of time, I won't write that. Uh, in the resolved conifold X uh, with boundary, so uh, with a brain that's given by this 
Lejean, oh, sorry, Lagrangian once it's passed through there, here. So that's not quite a thing that makes sense because the Lagrangian actually ran into the zero section, but you have to push it off of the zero section a bit, and then it, it moves over to here. So something like this. Um, and the idea is that, uh, so what do I mean by these, these arrows right here? So uh, you can define, for associated to k, you can define some sort of wave function, um, c sub k of x, which is the sum of the colored Humphrey polynomials. The NX. Uh, so this is just some sort of uh, generating function that encodes the, the uh, colored Humphrey polynomials. And over here, there's, there's some sort of gromov witten potential that counts uh, holomorphic curves with boundary on this Lagrangian LK. So I'll just write it for short as gromov witten potential. Um, FK of, so there's some parameters here that I don't have time to get into, but this is just counting holomorphic curves in X with boundary on LK. And then uh, what this correspondence is actually supposed to say is that CK of X is equal to the exponential of FK of X. So somehow uh, churn simons invariants over on this side correspond to gromov witten invariants over there. Um, so I'm really out of time. So what, what I'll say is that um, we can get some version of this by using uh, not contact homology or by more precisely by looking at the you know, more advanced uh, holomorphic curves with boundary on the Legendrian. Uh, that's, that's somehow what, what's happening is that we can, we can count holomorphic curves at infinity, so sort of off at, in the infinity direction here. And that uh, gives us some sort of uh, improved version of this relation, which then says that uh, there's some operator that when you apply it to this wave function, you get zero, and that operator is exactly this uh, uh, quantization of the augmentation polynomial. Um, I'm happy to talk about this more if you're interested, but I have run over, so I'll stop here. Thanks.